Welcome to CEF Insights, your source for closed-end fund information and education, brought to you by the Closed-End Fund Association. My name is Diane Merritt. Today we are joined by Axel Merck, President and Chief Investment Officer of Merck Investments. We're so glad you could be with us. Great to be with you. Can you discuss the key characteristics of companies in the precious metals and minerals sector, as well as the benefits and risks they present to investors? How do these benefits and risks differ from investing directly in the actual precious metals? Yes, so investing in the precious metal sector has unique opportunities and risks. And first of all, the reason either people invest in the sector because they're fascinated by it, but as a serious institutional investor, um, a key reason to invest in it is diversification. And uh, precious metals in general have had a near zero correlation to equities. And most notably, they have performed well in every stock market, bear market since the early 1970s, with a key exception in the early 80s, where real interest rates were pushed very high. Now, um, precious metals are known to be reasonably volatile, and uh, precious metals companies, mining companies, take this to another level. Now, the plus side of that is that with a fairly small component, you can get quite a bit of a boost to a, a portfolio. Now, that comes with wonderful risks and wonderful opportunities. Um, to just name a few, when you invest in the mining company itself, the, the general gist of it is that um, the fixed cost of mining is reasonably constant. That's a bit of a simplification, but if you assume that the price of the precious metals goes higher, you have more leverage in it because a 10% move in the uh, in the price of the metal can have a multiplier effect on the earnings because they get all the marginal revenue is profit. Now, all that said, it is a very diverse space. You have some senior mining companies that have fairly predictable cash flows, all the way down to exploration companies that are literally trying to strike gold. So the risk profiles are very, very different depending on where you are. Um, but taken together, they provide, on the one hand, um, a speculative opportunity, but more precisely, they provide an opportunity to, to add diversification to a portfolio. Passive investment strategies in various asset classes have gained a lot of traction in recent years. Merck Investments is an active investment manager. In the precious metal sector, what advantages do you see for an active manager with respect to managing risk and adding to performance? Yeah, so first of all, much of what we do is active. We do also do passive work. We actually have a passive a physical gold ETF in the market where investors can take delivery. Um, but ASA is an active fund, and we do a lot of active work. We do a lot of fundamental work, especially when it comes to the mining companies. And to just give you an idea, this sector overall isn't that huge, and there has been amazing consolidation in that sector, which has led to the passive folks, uh, most notably the indices, to be what I would call top heavy. Um, the benchmark for ASA is the FTSE Gold Miners Index. Has The top two names have 38% of the index. The top 10 holdings have 78% of the index. And in GDX, the most commonly known um, passive index, um, I don't have the exact number. It's a little over 60%, I believe, that the top 10 holdings are. So it's a, it's a very top-heavy index, or both of these indices are very top-heavy. And that obviously increases the risk that if anything doesn't go right in these companies, um, there is an issue. Also, it, I, I mentioned earlier that mining companies come in various flavors. So these indices tend to focus on the large companies. And when you do that, you're getting less of a diversification because they tend to be moving more with the general flows. Um, on the smaller companies, there's obviously also an index for the smaller companies, but it's a, by it being passively managed, you have to be very careful in the small companies that you choose companies that have sustainable cash flows, that have access to financing, and the index just can't differentiate that. So there is significant potential for the active manager to add value and manage that process properly and to just kind of to tell you, you asked earlier about the risks. Um, the risks in this sector are, are all the equity risks and then some, right? You can have management make mistakes. Well, in the, in the gold space, the, the life of a mine is not infinite. And so there you have, to, that's a risk you have to manage. You have to, I mentioned access to cash flow. Well, mining is expensive. And so ultimately, of course, the goal is that the gold you get out of the ground, for example, uh, pays for it. But 
you have to get there and survive to get there. And so there are many, many risks in that. Also, you have the risk, and the large companies are more subject to that than the smaller ones, is that they do whatever investors want them to do. And I, what I mean with that is that when you have a surge in the price of gold, which we've had in the past at times, um, then they might be trying to just maximize getting the, the ounces out of the ground or making unreasonable acquisitions. So there are all kinds of unique fast in this industry where I believe active management can add uh, great value. Axel, your firm has recently taken on the management of a traditional closed-end fund, ASA Gold and Precious Metals, symbol ASA. The fund was previously internally managed, and now Merck Investments has been hired as an external manager for the fund. What does this change mean to investors, and how do you see this impacting the corporate governance of the fund? Yes, so ASA is the oldest, I believe, closed-end fund that's trading on the New York Stock Exchange, founded in 1958. And so it's been through various iterations, and uh, for quite some years now, it was, quote-unquote, internally managed. And in the internal management model, all, everything, all the expenses go directly to the net asset value, and that means every stamp that you buy, if there's such a thing people buy anymore, all the salaries of the management and so forth. And that has some advantages and disadvantages as well, but because this segment in the market has been out of favor and performance has been negative in that space for some time, and because of the, the overall share count being reduced over the years, the fund had shrunk in size, and that then creates a cost structure that the board considered to be unsustainable in the long run, and they had a search as to what can they do, and so one of the things that has been decided is to move to an outside manager. We are the new outside manager, and you have an arm's length agreement on basis points, what the management fee is, and that puts the overall fund on a more sustainable model. So that's the, the background. Now, on top of that, as we have come in, um, we've worked with the board to put in place what we call our best practices. I'm not suggesting that in the past there were bad practices, but there are things you can do in, a, in an outsourced model where you outsource as many pieces as you can from fund accounting administration, where you have more cross-checks and whatnot, which we believe will be in the benefit of shareholders in the medium term at a cost point that is competitive. And then quite relevant to investors are two things, the investment philosophy and at the other end of the spectrum, the discount in the market. On the investment philosophy side, the fund had been managed very conservatively. And if you look at it, it was less volatile than the overall uh, sector the market has. The performance hasn't been all that great. And we obviously don't have a crystal ball, but what we are doing is we are making the fund a tad more assertive. We are moving down the ladder, so to speak, and in, in not investing in the royalty companies quite as much, not investing in the biggest names quite as much, moving more towards select development companies where we believe they have access to cash as they're growing, um, companies that we believe will react more favorably if and when the price of gold moves higher. At the same time, we try to impose and are imposing the, the risk management we have inside of our firm. We do have extensive experience managing residential investment vehicles so we can deal with the various things. And then the other thing I mentioned is the discount in the market. Well, many closed end funds, ASA in particular, has had a very significant discount in the market. And one thing that's different from us, from our predecessors, is that a lot of what we do has a public face. Um, if anybody Googles my name, they'll see us in many, many places. It's just in our, in our genes to be communicating more with the public. And so we try to get the word out. We recently held a webinar on ASA that's available on our website, for example. We're going things into deeper. We are very open to our, talking to any shareholder and potential shareholder who has an interest. And in communicating, we believe that we can get more attention onto ASA because we believe that discount in the market is an opportunity. So working actively on communicating what our ideas are, executing on those ideas, and then at the same time introducing best practices on the management, all these things we believe may help to reduce the discount. Obviously, we can't promise that, but we're working on that. And at the same time, we believe that the, the changes we're making in the portfolio may help the ASA to be a performer that makes it worthwhile for investors to, to obviously then, then pay the expense ratio of the fund. And how does your investment philosophy differ from the way ASA has previously been managed? And so I alluded to that a little bit with regard to the kind of more assertive management. 
Um, overall, obviously, the, the overall mandate, the objective of the fund has not changed. And the objective of the fund is to invest in gold and precious metals companies to conduct fundamental research, including site visits. Um, we have our portfolio manager, Peter Melides, is has come from us from Franklin Templeton, where he worked for almost 10 years on their precious metals fund. He has traveled to over 40 countries around the world and uh, knows the management of uh, almost all the mining companies out there quite well, knows all the brokerage firms um, very well, and uh, is willing and has shown to be able in the short life of the fund has had so far under our leadership, um, has been able to make this fund a tad more assertive. So anybody who kind of looks at the past performance will see, hopefully, that it is going to be more assertive. And what I mean with that is that um, metrics like the beta, we of course, we can't say what it will do, but by moving down that ladder a little bit on the size of the firm and being more diverse in that sense, we do believe it will give investors more what we think that many investors are looking for. They're either looking for a reduction of discount or they're looking, obviously, to, to make money. Now, anybody that buys ASA, I believe, is either going to buy it because they like the discount story, that they think that we can help reduce the discount, or they like that the, the space may do well and uh, through ASA they may get these at a discount. And so with our management, you get fresh blood, you get a management team that's motivated, you have the breadth also of the rest of what we do at Merck. We do a lot of work on interest rates, inflation, all aspects that are quite related to the price of the metal. And so while we, of course, don't have a crystal ball, as I mentioned already, um, we do believe that um, that additional input can help shape the direction that ASA is heading in. The U.S. economy is continuing on its 10-year expansion, but in many areas of the world, growth is quite slow. At what stage do you see us in the economic cycle? So I'm not telling you anything you don't know. The economy is an advanced stage of expansion. What I believe is a little different from what many people are thinking. I actually think that inflation your pressures are increasing. The Federal Reserve is highly complacent about the lack of inflation, and partly because inflation has been for so low for such a long time. But if you look at how many people have been moving from the sidelines into the job market, at some point we can't pull them in anymore. And so it may well be that the economy is going to slow just as um, those wage pressures are then jumping over and, and create other inflationary concerns. Also, the current inflation numbers and the Federal Reserve itself has said as much have been depressed mostly because of statistical measures. Um, those sort of headwinds to inflation are going to turn into tailwinds, and we wouldn't be surprised if, again, we're going to be very near the end of the economic expansion, and yet inflationary pressures are going to increase. Historically, the end of the economic cycle is favorable to gold and the gold mining companies. Now, all that said, the um, price of gold hasn't moved all that much. Not long ago, I was quoted in saying that we may even see another interest rate hike later this year. Um, the market obviously has gone the completely the opposite direction of that. But to me, I always am concerned what made the market be underpricing. And the, the concern about inflation is something that the market may be underpricing, in my view. How does this impact the way you structure your portfolio? So it is cautiously optimistic on the price of gold. We don't expect that the price of gold is going to blow out tomorrow. And by the way, when we structure our portfolio, we want to make sure that companies are sustainable at the current price level. So we're not going to buy companies that saying, hey, we think the gold price of gold is going to go up 20% and then this company is going to be profitable and it's going to make a killing. That's not how we operate. We're looking for, for good management that can execute based on their operating model and to the extent that they may need more capital, if you look at the smaller companies, that they have strong partners. And the sort of strong partners over the years have changed. In the past, they could look to investment funds but many investment funds don't have that sort of capital anymore because they have shrunk in size, so then they need to have other avenues. Now, that said, because we are positive on the price of gold in the medium term, that is one of the key reasons why we're working on making this fund more assertive. Now, obviously, I can't say what we'll do specifically tomorrow, but what I'm communicating to you is are things we have communicated elsewhere, including our, our recent webinar. Are valuations in the precious metal space at attractive levels? Well, they're certainly much more attractive than they have been in the past. Um, a value investor is always faced with the choice that something that's good value might become even better value down the road. Um, but if we look at a number of different metrics, yes, I do believe they're attractively valued. Be that at anything as, for example, Canadian investors that historically are 
good, uh, quite healthy investors in, in that space are significantly underinvested uh, based on research we see in our own analysis as well. Um, if you look at other metrics as how companies are valued based on cash flow, um, if you take like a, a present value model, those um, valuations also suggest that the valuation is low. Now, part of that is that many of the senior mining companies, those of the large mining companies, have not invested a lot of money. And that means the life of their mines has become shorter, and that means they may be forced or at least encouraged to do acquisitions. And obviously, we've seen some acquisitions before. And that is, by the way, one of the reasons why we've moved down the tier a little bit, because while there have been some acquisitions that are without a premium, some more recent ones are with a significant premium. And so we may be holding some of the funds that, that uh, some of the companies that might be acquired. Obviously, we don't know that, but we think for being positioned there, they might be benefiting from that. And there are other metrics. Um, some other current metrics you can use. So based on various metrics, uh, they are not expensive. And obviously, the price of gold has a big impact on that. And going back to your original question about the space as a whole, um, because there's leverage in the price of gold, well, to the extent that people believe the price of gold may be moving higher, then many companies in this space should have a positive performance. Now, obviously, the opposite is also true. The risk is that the price of gold goes down, and then it is all the more important that one chooses companies that have a sound operating model. Where do you see the best opportunities among precious metals companies? Well, I don't want to be too company specific, but I would encourage anybody to, to kind of get up to speed speed on what we do and the sort of companies that we invest in, um, and, and we're limit, limited as to what we can communicate, so our quarterly filings and so forth is probably the best source to go to. Um, now, I would discourage anybody to buy a precious metals company just because you see in some filing that we've bought it, mostly because you're not going to be around when we decide to, to sell it. And so, <laughs> personally, I've, I have, and there are some findings to that extent, I bought shares in ASA itself, and as my kind of vote of confidence that where I see the, um, the opportunity, and, uh, and obviously there, there are other choices investors have. The uniqueness about the space is that you can choose the risk profile that you're looking for. So in a closed-end fund um, like ASA, you've got the opportunity of maybe having a discount that closes plus the active management plus the type of companies we choose in an ETF. And obviously, they have their own set of risks, but you're getting, uh, you know what you're getting, but what you're getting may be, because of the deficiency of the index, not ideal. And then, of course, you can go out and buy individual companies, but in this space, it is very, very risky to go after individual companies uh, simply because the individual company risks are all that significant. And that's why holding a portfolio of mining companies is something that investors might want to look at. And how do you believe an allocation to equities of companies in the precious metals sector is best positioned in an investor's diversified portfolio? Yes. Yeah, so obviously, we can't give specific investment advice. Um, as I indicated in the introduction, the mining companies tend to be more volatile than regular equity portfolios. So people can keep that in mind. And if you look at your traditional, let's take a traditional 60-40 portfolio, equities versus fixed income, how do you create diversification? And uh, a mining portfolio allows investors to get something that historically has performed well during many bear markets. Um, by the way, not all companies have done well in bear markets in the financial uh, in the financial crisis, some small companies didn't have access to credit, and so they are mining, those mining companies had challenges as well. Um, but you can get with a fairly small, small addition uh, quite a bit of additional diversification. Now, clearly, if somebody is very pessimistic about markets, this is an aggressive way, if one wants to say it, to get diversification. There's always cash as well available. And so I cannot give a specific recommendation on whether you should have 5% in the portfolio, 10% or more. It really depends on the, on the investor. The one advice I do give to people is that you should not have more of anything in your portfolio than you can sleep with at night. And I'm not referring to the gold part that you could put under your pillow. <laughs> Excellent. We appreciate that you have taken time to join us today. My pleasure. And we want to thank you for tuning in to another CEF Insights podcast. For more educational content, please visit our website at www.cefa.com.